Dicen, y seguro que es cierto, que es en decoración, en diseño, el mayor museo del mundo. Y dicen, y quizás es cierto, que están presentando la cama más confortable del mundo, aquella que ha soportado muchos embates. La gente no solo va a dormir, sino que hace otras cosas. La picaresca, la rutina, nos lleva a Londres. Y si le decimos, lo respalda el tema que la literatura de nada menos que Shakespeare, Ben Johnson, Lord Byron, Charles Dickens, hablan, están. Y nos menciona, y por supuesto quizás el balance sea exagerado o no. Esperamos su opinión. The bedware makes a strong case for being the most famous piece of English furniture, but it's not a typical museum exhibit, unlike other distinguished pieces in the V&A's collection, whose histories are discreetly private, dignified and serious. The bedware trails a reputation that's sociable, jovial, sometimes badly behaved, even downright disreputable. It is twice the size of other surviving Elizabethan beds. And for me, the most convincing hypothesis as to why the bed was created is as an outside curiosity to attract customers to one of the many coaching inns in the town of Ware in Hertfordshire. As early as 1596, a German tourist, Prince Ludwig Anhalt Coton, slept in what must have been the bed. And years later, he recorded his visit, describing four couples sleeping side by side with so much room that they wouldn't disturb one another. The bed always had a bawdy reputation. The bigger the bed, the more room for companions and the more opportunity for mischief. The tales become exaggerated over time. And in 1765, it was said that 26 butchers and their wives lay in the bed one night for a bet. In the 17th century, grand beds were very expensive and a prime position within the home to demonstrate wealth status and the luxury textiles that you were able to afford. Now, the original textiles of the bed of wear are long, long gone. And what you see here today are accurate replicas designed to suggest how a smart bed would have been presented in around 1600. We can see layer by layer how the bed is built up. At the bottom, stout hemp cords stretched through the frame and these support woven bed mats. On top of those, three mattresses for depth of comfort and height, progressively softer as we go. Wool flock in the bottom, feathers in the middle, and soft down up above. On top, bleached white linen sheets. Some travelers would even bring their own linens with them to avoid the unwelcome effects of bed bugs, a notorious problem with inns. On top of those, wool blankets for warmth, and then a real luxury for 1600. Uh, a silk covered quilt and a reversible coverlet woven in wool with threads of gold and linen. Valances and curtains woven in wool for warmth. The other great thing about curtains is that they would provide privacy for those sleeping in the bed when you have servants in the bedroom or passing through the room. And completing the ensemble oak bed staves to prevent the weight of layers slipping off the bed in the middle of the night, but also very useful for knocking down lumps that may develop in the mattress. The oak framework of the bed is essentially original and an amazing survival, comprising the great foot posts, which support a panelled tester, effectively a ceiling over your head. And then there's the magnificent headboard this is decorated in marquetry, essentially a kind of jigsaw of coloured pieces of wood. This would have been the work of German trained craftsmen working in South London. All the visible surfaces of the bed are loaded with Renaissance ornament copied from fashionable continental prints. We've got columns and caryatids, half length human figures supporting a weight above them, spiky acanthus sleeve and guilloche, a circular swirling motif that the English particularly enjoyed. Add to this brightly coloured paint of which many traces remain. 
and the overall effect of all this ornament would have been one of overwhelming richness and grandeur, particularly in candlelight and with the curtains closed. Looking closely at the surfaces of the bed, we can see that they're almost all disfigured or enlivened, depending on your point of view, with deep graffiti scratched into the surface of, of the wood. Not only graffiti, but also the red blobs of sealing wax, originally with the owner's signet ring impressed into it. Those who'd slept in the bed obviously wanting to leave their mark on it and to have it recorded for posterity, and here it is. Mind you, the scratches and graffiti were probably one reason why the museum turned down the opportunity to buy the bed in 1865, describing it as a coarse and mutilated relic, in no wise appropriate as a new acquisition. The bed was famous from its very earliest days, but the popular appeal was enhanced by an array of literary references. Most famously, Shakespeare in his comedy Twelfth Night, but also it is mentioned by Ben Jonson, Lord Byron, who accentuates the sexual innuendo around the bed, and Charles Dickens. A Victorian Christmas pantomime added a whole raft of additional stories, all of them spurious. Here we come across a tradition that the bed had been made for royalty, though whether it was Edward IV or Henry VIII seems open to question. Also the idea that the bed's maker returned to haunt occupants of the bed, taking it out like bedbugs with pinches on commoners who were impudent enough to sleep in the bed. Over the years, many strange and inventive traditions became associated with the bed. This postcard view, when the bed stood at the Rye House Hotel, shows a pair of antlers. Enterprising landlords would perform a oath or mock ceremony standing underneath the antlers, promising to avoid cuckoldry when a husband or wife betrays their partner. When it arrived at the V&A in 1931, the bed was the largest and most expensive piece of furniture the museum had ever purchased, and today it stands at the heart of the British galleries. It is an amazing survival, extraordinary in every sense, not just its great size and age, but that we know so much about its history and how people have responded to it. Above all, the bed is a story of continuity and commonality. When we look at the bed today, we're doing exactly what generations of visitors and tourists have done over 400 years. Gorp, smile, and wonder at this extraordinary thing.